Hey Rebels, what does it take for a brewery to survive and thrive in today's economy? From nano brewers serving suds and tacos and hyper-local neighborhood models to the titans of industry who brew millions of barrels a year, what is it that ensures the success of a brewery and what puts the final nail in the coffin? I'm your host, Matthew Barton, and today we're going to look at those questions and more on today's episode of Rebellion Brewing Podcast. Today's guest is Dr. Jason Foster. He's an associate professor with the Athabasca University, and he has written extensively about craft beer over the years. He has a regular beer column with CBC Radio 1 Edmonton, but if you're from Saskatchewan, you might have seen his work in Planet S, or maybe the Prairie Dog even. Jason, welcome to the show. Glad to, glad to be here. How's it going? I'm good, I'm good. So, for the benefit of the guest, tell me a little bit about your craft beer background. Sure. I mean, I think, if first and foremost, um, I'm a long-time home brewer. I've been a home brewer for almost 30 years now. That's kind of where my passion for craft beer and my love of beer sort of started. Um, I'm also now a, uh, one of the highest-ranking BJCP judges in the country. And uh, for about a decade or so now, I've been watching the, the, the beer industry and on the prairies in particular is kind of my beat, um, both on my website on beer.org and on the various sort of columns and avenues that I've been able to, to do some writing to, to, to muse about beer and to review beer and sample beer. And it's been kind of a, it's been a fun gig. So in terms of uh, what you've been watching over the last, say, five to ten years, what are you kind of noticing? Well, I think the, the overarching sort of picture that I sort of see is I'm seeing the prairies catch up a little bit. I mean, I think when I started watching the industry in this part of the world, we were, we were kind of lagging behind. Um, we only had a handful of breweries. You know, I think there was like 10 or 11 breweries in Alberta. There was only Paddock Wood in, in Saskatchewan. You know, it was, a, it was a small scene at that time. You know, I, I like to joke that when I was doing my website back when I first started doing this, I could catch up on all the news on the prairies by making three phone calls. <laughs> um, but I think, so I think what I'm seeing is I'm seeing a, a much more vibrant industry developing both you know in manitoba saskatchewan and alberta so in alberta in particular but i even think we're seeing it in saskatchewan manitoba so i think there's there is some sense we're a bit of a late to the party in comparison to ontario or quebec or bc or the states but i think now that we're in the party we're we're uh, we're in full swing and it's a very very fun time to be watching the industry in this part of the world you had uh, previously mentioned to me that you had talked about there were three paths to craft beer in Alberta, Manitoba, and Saskatchewan had each kind of taken their own route. Can you kind of explain and unpack what you meant by that? Yeah, I mean, I think the, the, what I think I've seen in terms of the, the three industries have sort of grown up. They've kind of grown up in a very sort of unique way that sort of matches kind of their sort of local situation. I mean, starting sort of in the West in Alberta, which of course is where I live, and so therefore I'm most familiar with Alberta, is it's been an issue where there's just been this rapid explosion in the number of breweries, many of them very small, um, and a very much a drive towards, well, I think for the most part, Alberta started off being very much about sort of mainstream accessible kind of beers, and now we're starting to see much more experimentation and a lot more sort of vary, variation in terms of both the business models uh, and approaches to beer that we've seen in Alberta. I think Saskatchewan has been a lot more rooted in community, um, is sort of my sense, is that, you know, it's not as many breweries, um, but they're kind of the ones that have formed, I think, have been more anchored um, in, in the communities that they come up from. And I think Saskatchewan also has the historical context that you've been battling, where for years you had, you know, sort of what I call the pseudo-brew pubs, right, where it was the, the extract, dump, and stir operations. And I think it really gave some consumers initially, you know, sort of a bad sense of, of what craft beer was supposed to be because that wasn't real craft beer. So I think you've been kind of having to fight upstream a little bit to try and navigate that. And I think doing breweries in Saskatchewan have been doing a great job of trying to actually show and break through and show what that looks like. And then I think Manitoba, again, has its own sort of model where it's very much Winnipeg. Um, you know, Edmonton, for example, a lot of the, or Alberta, for example, a lot of the breweries are in small towns. That's how they've kind of, you know, been able to carve some space for themselves. Um, 
in, Man- in Manitoba, it's Winnipeg. It's a Winnipeg-dominated industry, and so you've, again, I think you've got a different dynamic. You've got a handful of breweries who are kind of playing in the same market, and so they're having to distinguish themselves through other means, to both in terms of the beer that they make um, and their branding. And so I think you're seeing very three, three very distinct industries shaping up in the three provinces. When you speak to what's happening in Alberta, how many breweries have opened? Oh, goodness. I mean, it's been really quite the spectacular three or four years. Um, there's about 120 breweries in Alberta now, um, where if you were to look four years ago, that number was like 30 approximately. So we've seen about 80 or 90 breweries open up in three or four years in Alberta. A huge chunk of that, as I say, a lot of that is in small centers. A whole bunch of them are in sort of the, some of the smaller towns, the Slave Lakes, you know, the, the you know, even like little places like which is in northern Alberta. You know, they, so lots of those kind of breweries are kind of serving just that local population of 10,000 people or whoever it might be. Um, but then a huge explosion in Calgary. Calgary's been where we've seen just a massive number of breweries. In fact, so much so and so quickly that I think many observers in the industry are wondering about if did Calgary explode a little too fast. And I think that still remains to be seen. I think the, the, ju- the jury's out on that one still. But that, it's just been a fascinating bit of explosion. And I think a lot of that, Alberta's a good example of how government policy can both hinder the growth of craft beer and how it can facilitate the growth of craft beer. Alberta has seen both. Um, for years, the Alberta government policy really put a brewery in this province. And then about four years ago, uh, well, a little bit longer than that, but about four years ago, we started to see the, the, the ramifications of policy changes that allowed for the growth that we've seen. That we've seen. For the benefit of listeners who don't necessarily know the history, you're referring to production caps and then the levy that was offered to local producers, right? Precisely, yeah. For many, many years, Alberta had this strange rule. We had to have a minimum production capacity. So in other words, you had to build a big enough brew house to be able to do it. It was basically 5,000 hectoliters a year. Which is not insignificant. No, that's that's actually in a a context of, of the prairies. That's actually a large brewery. Like that's how big rebellion is. Yeah, exactly, right? And and it just, it, just drew, it just made it really, really difficult to open a brewery, the capital up front that you would need. And then there's the question of how did you sell How do you sell that beer, right? I mean, the market, you know, I, I would argue in Alberta and in Saskatchewan and Manitoba, craft beer is still only a small percentage of the overall sales, of beer sales. So where would you, where would you sell all this beer? But then um, about, about six or seven years ago, the government eliminated that minimum and then about four years ago, changed the bar cup structure to try and create a bit of an advantage for Alberta-based breweries. And the combination of those two policy shifts, I think, were quite significant in allowing breweries to both operate open and create a space for themselves in the market. In Saskatchewan, it seems like it's gone a little bit different. They modified some of the production cap but they didn't offer kind of uh, incentives the way the Alberta government did. So it seems like growth has been more slow but sustained. Yeah, I, I totally would agree. Yeah, I think that is totally what the Saskatchewan model is. I mean, the, the big difference for Saskatchewan is that because there's more, and, and this is, I think, changing now with the privatization of your retail, um, that you've there has been, you know, there was a... Uh, the import controls that the SLGA was able to place by deciding which beers would be imported into the province and which wouldn't helped create a little bit of space and a little bit of environment. And that's something that Alberta didn't have. Alberta's always had open borders. Anyone who wants to sell beer in Alberta can. And that made it harder for small local you know, startups to be able to create that niche, create that space for themselves. And so the markup structure changes were designed to try and help them do that. And I think as controversial as they were, I think they were successful in doing that. And Saskatchewan, I think, again, is a different model. You've had a much more slower growth, but I think it's, it looks very sustainable to me. It looks like who, you know, the, the breweries that are there are succeeding. You're gonna, you're gonna, I think you're going to continue to see a few more come in the coming years, but not probably the same level of explosion that we've seen in Alberta. When you talk about Calgary, do you think it was also maybe due to some oil money kicking around? Oh, that's precisely why. I mean, I think if you look at the the difference between Edmonton and Calgary, where Calgary now has, you know, three dozen breweries and Edmonton still only has a handful, it comes down to the availability of investment capital. And and the growth in breweries in Calgary happened at exactly the time where there was 
a downturn in oil and gas. And so there was a lot of oil and gas investment money sitting idle. But they didn't want to be investing it in their oil companies or ventures of that nature because it, wasn't, it was a risky time. But you've got, some, you know, so I think there were some investors looking around for other opportunities, other places to put their money so they can maybe get a return on. And I think that's what we've seen. There's been a lot of oil money that's flowed around in Calgary that's gotten these breweries up and running, where, for example, Edmonton, it's been a much more traditional model of self-financing um, and small groups of investors coming from a you know, variety of different walks of life. So the question now becomes for Calgary is, as these breweries become three, four, five years old, do those investors, those oil style investors start to expect some kind of return? Um, and as the folks at Rebellion well know, <laughs> opening a brewery is not a license to print money. It's slow. It's hard. You know, you, 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 you can turn a profit, but you know, it's, you're not going to make gazillions of dollars out of it. And it can take a long time to get your initial investment paid off. And so I'm, I'm curious to see how impatient those investors in Calgary get um, as they start to realize that, uh, you know, it's 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 not like uh, pulling pulling oil out of the ground and selling it for hundred dollars a barrel. It's more of a slow burn. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Which so we'll see. I mean, they may have the the, the patience, but I do think that there's some questions that the Calgary breweries are going to have. I think. There's one kind of thing you touched upon. I wanted to kind of go back to, was the nature of the Alberta market. Um, when you said it was really open, like SLJ controlled very strongly who could sell in Saskatchewan, whereas in Alberta it was open. So I remember hearing rumors about how breweries would be dumping stale and old product there and just blowing it out because they knew they could. Uh, though that, those, those rumors are 100% true that we saw. I think it's a little less so now, although I still think I see it. But it was, Alberta for a number of years was the place where if you had some product that wasn't moving in your home country, in your home territory, you just you know, you throw a, throw it on a pallet, ship it out to Alberta, and it'll sell at some point, and you know you, you sell it a low a low price point in order to 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 create the sort of the movement that you're looking for. That was definitely a problem. There were some breweries I think were more notorious than others for doing that, um, and it created a flood. And even even legitimate imports, even breweries who are saying, okay, I'm going to take my best product and I'm going to send it to Alberta as a, as a secondary market for my, for my beer, it just created a very, very crowded retail space. There was just lots of different available beer for Alberta consumers to drink, which means you know, if you're some small, new Alberta brewery, cutting through that noise was a lot more challenging. Um, that I think we would see in other provinces where because of the, the liquor control boards and the, and the rules that they have, they were, able to re- they were able to manage the number and range of beers that are on people's beer shelves, which has its positives and its negatives. I mean, obviously, it was fun to be a beer consumer in Alberta, <laughs> but it wasn't so fun to be a beer producer in Alberta for that very reason. I've heard stories of guys who would take their, you know, their Suburban or their station wagon out to Alberta and buy a bunch of beer and bring it back to Saskatchewan that you just couldn't find anywhere else. Oh, I totally believe that. Yeah, we have, you know, some of the, li- the liquor stores here have some of the best selections on the continent. I mean, I've, I've traveled lots of places around the country and into the States, and anytime I go somewhere, I, you know, seek out craft beer, and I, you know, some of the stores that we have in Alberta are unparalleled in terms of just the range and the number of different beer you can find from around the continent and around the world. So what are some of the lessons that maybe Saskatchewan can take from Alberta's experience since Alberta has had so much activity? Well, I think, I think, well, I think there's a couple of things that, that, that I think if you're a, someone who is interested in, in, in growing craft beer in Saskatchewan, I think one is be careful about growing too fast. I and mean, I mean that both on, the number of breweries, because, I mean, we're starting to see some closures in Alberta, which is not unnatural. I mean, that's expected. Any maturing industry is going to have closures. But I even mean that on, an, on a brewery level. Like, I've noticed where breweries founder is when they try and make a jump. You know, they, their initial demand is good. They're producing, you know, they're producing all they can. And so then they try either to reinvest in more equipment or to other markets a little too fast, a little too soon before they've been able to kind of make sure they're firmly rooted. That's when they run into trouble. Um, so I would argue that any people in Saskatchewan manage your growth, both as an individual brewery, 
and as the industry kind of collectively. And I think that is one of the challenges that Alberta is facing that Saskatchewan could try to avoid. Um, and I think the other piece is to be wary of playing the price point game. Um, I see a lot of breweries in Alberta have gotten themselves in a bit of a tough spot because they've decided to try and price their six packs at a point, at a price point where it's kind of competitive with some of the, some of the macro, you know, some of the macro beers or some of the discount brands. And that just is a hard game to play because A, you're, you're cutting out your margins and B, you're, uh, you're, you're, you're appealing to consumers, I think, what I would argue in the wrong way. Instead of appealing to the nature of the story behind craft and the quality behind craft, you're, you're basically just sort of saying, well, our product's just like everybody else's product. So, you, you know, you, maybe you pay 50 cents more for ours, but, you know, it's, it's, that, that's, you know, it's not that big. And so I think that's a, that's a trouble point that a brewery can get themselves into if they're not careful. You had talked about uh, brewery models and you were doing some comparison and analysis and it feels like what you've just said, what you just answered kind of flows from that article you wrote. Um, am I up a tree or is this kind of making sense? <laughs> yeah, so I've been doing some analysis recently around what makes a brewery successful, what lessons we can learn from failure, um, and what 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 are the components that allow a craft brewery in this part of the world to make a go of it? Um, and I think one of the adages that, that, that I've kind of long held to and I think continues to hold true is that good beer, making good beer is essential, but good beer is not going to save you if your other, if your other elements are not in place, uh, if you don't have other fundamentals down correctly. And I think that that's something that I think too many breweries don't pay attention to. Um, they focus, and understandably, because they're beer people and they love good beer, they focus on making this really high-quality beer and, and you know, making it as good as they possibly can, which is great, but they're not paying attention to other components of the business that it requires to actually, because at the end of the day, you're not a home brewer. You've got to sell beer. And so you've got to find a way to make sure that that good beer that you're making gets into people's hands and that they want to try it and they want to go back and try it again. And that means you've got to have other components of your business plan together. You've got, a, you've got to have a good business plan. You're, you're, you're operating a business, which means you've got to know what your business plan is. What kind of strategy are you adopting? Who's your audience? Who's your market? And I think there's different models that are that – are, that's one of the nice things, I think, about how the industry has evolved in Western Canada – it used to be there was one model, <laughs> and you know I like to call it sort of the alley cat, wild rose, paddock wood, you know half pints kind of model, where you have three or four core brands. There's one that's the big seller, and you know often it was a fruit beer or it might be the blonde ale or something of that nature. It's your big seller. It's what keeps the lights on, and then you got a darker beer and you got a hoppier beer, and then you have some seasonals that you rotate around. That used to be the model, and you're mostly a production brewery, with an emphasis on packaging and as keg sales when possible. I think now there's a much bigger diversity of, of business models, um, whether it be tap room focused, whether it be kind of a nano brewery approach. Um, the brew pub model has always, of course, been valid as well. So I think there's a number of different ways in which you can run your business, but you've got to know which one you're doing because you can't be everything. Um, and I think that's one of the things that people often make the mistake of. They try and be both the packaging production brewery and the small funky tap room place and that's a very hard bridge to be on both sides of and then the other components is you just got you got to have good branding and you got to have good marketing and you got to have some people focusing on sales um a brewery recently closed in edmonton here two sergeants brewing and they had a number of things that went wrong but one of them was that it was just the two guys Right? They, they didn't have a sales force. They didn't have someone whose job it was was to focus on the marketing and focus on the branding and going out and doing the legwork, you know, pounding pavement to, to, to drum up sales. And so as a result, they just never, the brand never took off. People didn't know who they were. And so when they don't know who you are, they're not going to seek you out. Or if they see your beer on the shelves, they're not necessarily going to pick it up because they don't have any connection to you. And I think that's just one of the lessons that breweries need to understand is that you got to have good beer, yep, because if you have crappy beer, you're not going to be in business very long. 
but you but you got to do more than that and that's i think one of the that's that's part of the nature of a maturing industry i think is that you can't just throw your doors open and have people come it's not how the industry works anymore man that's that's kind of what we're seeing here kind of what we've been discussing is it's you can have a plan but what you got to be able to take a punch you got to be resilient yeah yeah, no, you, and because you're going to take punches. Like, it's the nature of the industry. Is, things are going to go wrong. And it can be a combination of stuff, right? I mean, it's a highly regulated industry, which means there's always going to be headaches dealing with the various government agencies that you have to deal with, right? And it's a, consumers are fickle. Um, you know, the, the, these days, beer consumers are always kind of on the lookout for something new and interesting. And at some point, you stop being the new, and like, that's one of the things I'm seeing in Alberta a lot, is a lot of the, sort of the, breweries were opened at the beginning of the big explosion so now they're like three four five years old or they're not the shiny new bauble anymore they've got so they have to find a new way to keep consumers come keep customers coming to them because there's been 50 other breweries open since they've opened they're newer and they've got you know that sort of shiny new car feel to them while you know you're now with the, the two or three year old car that you know you're comfortable with but it, you know you, you might you start to see some of the blemishes and that's, that's an issue that a brewery has to deal with. You've got to figure out not just how you produce that new, that initial splash, but how do you then maintain it? How do you create um, momentum for your company over the medium term? That's something we've been discussing a lot. We call it the phenomenon of rotation nation <laughs> where people just chase the brand new seasonal and they don't appreciate your core brands they're not purchasing them anymore so you see those sales drop and then once the you can't keep up with the innovation or the costs of discovering or finding new beers to rotate in as seasonals people tune out precisely yeah precisely it's it's a it's a it's a it's a dangerous game to play and i realize it's because consumers are kind of driving that a bit but you really got to find a way to to, to resist that chasing every new kind of fad every new sort of hey here's my crazy milkshake you know white stout ipa you know <laughs> it's you know, the it, and finding a way to still stay anchored in what it is you actually want to produce and what you're trying to do over the long term because i think you can get lost in that constant churn and i think what happens one of the one of the casualties of playing that game is you lose that ba- you lose the branding you don't have that core sense of oh yeah i know who that is i know who what you know if you think about rebellion brewing you want someone to think of oh yeah they're the guys that do this right and i think the most successful breweries are the ones that have created a space for themselves who you know this is what they do and i think because again they've been focused and they've recognized they can't just be knocked back and forth on the basis of whatever the latest trendy thing is. I mean, I don't, I don't know what's happening in Saskatchewan, but I noticed, for example, here in Alberta, the Kvaik yeast craze is going, going nuts. Everybody's producing a Kvaik yeast or a beer with a Kvaik yeast, right? And I just sort of feel like, well, okay, I can get 20 different Kvaik beers now, what's distinguishing them and then how am i telling the difference between the different breweries who are doing it because they're all just hopping on at the same time and i have no doubt that they'll hop off as soon as that stops becoming the hot new sexy thing in craft beer it's super funny you mentioned kvike yeast because we have our birthday party coming up in november and one of the casks is a kvike yeast uh cask cool (laughs) <laughs> I mean, it, it, this isn't an argument for not doing it, right? It's it's just what I've noticed is how there's just these bandwagons that happen, right? And suddenly everyone's producing something, right? Um, milkshake IPAs. Milkshake IPAs, IPAs, exactly, right? And, and you know, thank God we haven't seen glitter beer here yet, but <laughs> I imagine someone is going to do it at some point. Uh, and we did a glitter beer for our anniversary birthday party <laughs> last year. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, see, that's fine because it's it's fun. It's your birthday, it's your anniversary party. It's totally it's that's a moment when you can have fun and you should be having fun and experimenting and playing around with it a little bit. But the point is not to not do those things. I'm not saying don't try doing a Kavik you know, Kavik beer as a brewery. But it's like know that that's not your core, right? That's not your core business. That's fun. It's something interesting to maybe you know draw some attention of some new customers. 
or give an old customer a reason to give you a try again, but don't lose sight of what you're actually trying to produce. Right? What, what kind of brewery are you? Who are you selling your beer to? And never lose sight of that. That's the piece that I think often happens is that breweries lose sight of who they are. I remember, this is not quite applicable, but I think about Big Rock in the 1990s. And so, of course, Big Rock, of course, is pioneer. We all, everybody in Western Canada should be, you know, uh, giving a toast to, to McNally because he was a pioneer. He blazed the trail for craft brewers in this part of the world. But in the late 90s, early thousands, they completely lost their direction. They, they lost the sense of what they were trying to be. They got big. They started having international ambitions. But the reason I bring them up in this particular context is I remember they started chasing every fad. Right? They got on the lime beer fad. They got on the low-carb beer fad. They got on the, you know, you name it, and they were releasing that beer. And they were just constantly playing this game of trying to match the big boys and the trendy beer and as a consequence, I think they kind of lost their soul. They, you, you stopped knowing what Big Rock was about. I mean, who, was, who is Big Rock? Well, they're the guys that have a lime beer today and a low-carb beer tomorrow and then a, you know, a, a light lager the next day. And I think that it's a danger a that can happen. And vodka spritzer tomorrow. Yeah, exactly. And so I think that, and again, they're a much bigger brewery, which has more complicated dynamics in terms of what happened with them. But I think it's the, the lesson is still the same. Is when you sort of lose track of who you are and what you're there to do, um, customer, you lose customers. Customers kind of just drift away, and that's what's happened to Big Rock is people kind of drifted away from them because they didn't know what they stood for anymore. Interesting. Well, you had asked me what's going on in Saskatchewan. Um, we know that craft beer as a segment, as a sector, is approximately three percent market share, and we also know that in more mature markets and other provinces and other states that can approach 15 to 18 percent market share mm -hmm. so we know there's a lot of opportunity to grow still but how do we meet that demand and what is our place in it i think we're still figuring that out we're still growing yeah i think that i think that, that that's perfectly true and i think the, the lesson that people in the breweries in saskatchewan need to learn and know and remember is you're not going to turn you're not going to become Portland in the next five years, right? Like you're at three percent, which is great, but your hope needs to be that in five years you're at six percent, right? Which is still doubling the size of the segment, but it's still relatively small. And so I think you, everyone needs to kind of realize that this is this is a slow process that happens over time. I mean, Alberta's had this explosion of breweries, but I would argue we're still in the single. Well, I know we're still in the single digits in terms of the craft segment. Um, even with 120 breweries now, right? Like having more breweries doesn't mean you're getting a bigger segment. I mean, it, the growth is just by the nature of how this works, the growth is going to be slow. And I think you raise a good question, right? What is Rebellion's place in that growing market? What is Paddock Wood's place in that growing market? What is Nokomis's place in that growing market? I think those are questions that each individual brewery needs to ask themselves but even the industry as a whole needs to ask itself is like how do we grow in a sustainable way as a group of companies who compete but in kind of a funny way <laughs> because because the segment's so small and there's so much potential for growth the nature of the competition i think is different i mean that's another thing that happens down the road you start to look in bc um and some in, in ontario the competition starts to get a lot fiercer because the low-hanging fruit's gone, right? If they're up at 18, 20, 25% of the market, they're basically reaching, reaching top end, which means now they really are competing with each other instead of being able to carve out an extra percent here, an extra percent there, which means then there's room for everybody. When you're kind of topping out what your, your craft segment is, then you actually are competing against each other. And that changes the dynamic. And I think that's a challenge that we need to all learn from looking at BC as Alberta and Saskatchewan and Manitoba brewers, is how to prevent some of what they've, the path that they've gone down because they didn't see it coming. We can see it coming. So we got lots of time to plan for it, and we need to try and do that, I think. Final question. What does all of this mean for consumers? What do you think it means? Well, I think this is, this is a glorious time to be a beer consumer in this part of the world. Um, I think... The, you know, we're seeing not just in terms of 
the, the number of different breweries and the number of different beers you can get. I actually think the nature of how these industries are growing is forcing everybody to be better. And so I think we're getting not just more beer, but better quality beer. And I think if the industry can continue to be mindful about where it's going, everybody under, you know, tries to figure out what their place in the industry is, who their market is, who are they trying to appeal to. If, people can continue, if the breweries continue to stay focused on that, then I think for consumers, they're going to get product that's, I mean, for lack of a better phrase, is sort of tailored to them. Right? If, if I'm a brewery who knows who my market is, then I'm going to make beer that's going to really appeal to that piece of the market. And I'm not trying to appeal to everybody. I'm trying to appeal to certain demographics that I know are kind of where my target is. And I think that that's a great thing for consumers because it means we're getting, you know, we're getting exactly the kind of product that we want to try. Um, and I think that's a, it's a great time as a result to be a consumer of, of craft beer in, in the prairies. Tell me you're going to be able to come back on the show in like a year from now and we can do another series of hot takes. <laughs> yeah, that'd be fun. I think if we, yeah, we could make this like an annual feature. The show, see, to see how wrong I was <laughs> and, and how things have changed uh, from year to year. That would be fun. <laughs> Jason, I want to thank you for your time today. My pleasure. Rebels, thanks for listening today. I'm going to include links to Jason's blog on beer.org and all his social media channels, so you can find about more of his stuff and do a deeper dive on the craft beer scene and really find out what he's thinking about and what he's talking about. Mark is the one who recommended Jason to come on the show. He said, you got to hear what Jason's got to say. He's got really good opinions, and he's a really bright guy. So credit to Mark Heisey, president of Rebellion Brewing. He really respects what Jason has to say, and I think you should too. I'm also proud to let you know that the Rebellion Brewing Podcast is an affiliate member of the Saskatchewan Podcast Network. If you're into podcasts and you're looking for great content produced right here in our province, the Sask Podcast Network at saskpodcastnetwork.com is a great one-stop shop to discover local stories to listen to. As always, if you want the latest news about Rebellion Brewing, be sure to check us out on Facebook, Instagram, and Untapped. Thank you for joining the Rebellion. <laughs>